Good morning on this Labor Day weekend. Hope you had a good weekend so far. Certainly uh, enjoyed the rain last couple of days. That was a blessing indeed. <clears throat> we start with a word of prayer. And Ethan, would you lead some prayer, please? We're on page 10, uh, the sin to beware, that's the topic of it. Well, of course, the sin it's talking about here is the uh, sin of covetousness. Now, when is enough enough? And that's where covetousness comes in. So I was a person really only needs so much to survive on. And when one covets, this individual puts his or her faith in the item that he is coveting. Instead of faith in God, that God will provide. And when they fail to realize that every blessing that we have is a product of God, of what God has given to us. And the last thing that God wants is for the blessings He has given to us to cause a separation. He doesn't want that. His blessing to separate us from Him. He doesn't want that to happen. So that's the sin that we're looking at this morning the sin of covetousness. And the scripture there is Luke 12, 13 through 21. We'll read that. It says here, for, for, uh, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetous, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So it is that, so it is, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and, and, is, and is not rich toward God. So that's the parable here of the Lord gives to the rich farmer, but it brings about of the individual that, or two individuals that were having a quarrel over what they're going to inherit. And of course, the Lord is speaking to both of them here uh, when, he, when he gives a solution, at least a solution. He says, I'm not the arbitrator here. And then he talks about how one could be a covetous individual. Well, the first question there what is sin? And 1 John 3 and verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The uh, Greek definition of what sin is, it means to miss the mark. If you're thinking about missing the mark, you put a target up, and maybe most of us have done some target shooting before. You put a target up and you start shooting, and every time you miss, you miss the target. Well, you might say, well, I'll get closer. You get closer and closer and closer, and finally, you're right there at the target. I mean, you're pointing point blank, and you shoot, and you still miss, and you wonder, how did I do that? How did I miss? Well, that's what sin is, when we miss the standard that God has put before us. 
He wants us to live, a, live a, a life of righteousness, a holiness life, a holy life. And yet, we still miss the mark that God has provided for us. And, and that's, what, that's what the definition of sin is. And, and, uh, and when it comes to covetousness and or the blessings that God has given to us, sometimes we miss the mark. And we do the opposite of what God wants us to do with these blessings. Question two, what will sin do to us? There's two verses, Isaiah 59, uh, 1 and 2. I got verse 2 up. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin separates us from God. We serve a, a holy God, a pure God, a sinless God. And when we commit that first sin, whatever that first sin is, whenever we reach the age of accountability, and with that, everybody's different, but at some point we commit that first sin, and that's when we have separated ourselves from God and uh, because we have become sinful. As Romans 6.23 there says, for the wages of sin is death. That's not much of a paycheck to sin, and then the wage of that Pay, pay is death is what it is so the wages of sin is death not much of a paycheck that's spiritual death that he's speaking of here so again covetous, covetousness is falling under this it is a sin if one commits then one finds themselves separated from God number three what sin did Jesus say we should beware well, again that's covetous Covetousness, uh, Luke 12, 15, again, where he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. That's what he's speaking of. What's the last commandment of the Ten Commandments? What's number 10? Thou shall not covet. Just because it's the last one of the ten doesn't make it less of or, or, or any other. Because it's very important, as I think the question comes up later, if... Uh, Covetous leads to many other sins is what it will do. And again, just because it's last doesn't mean that the Lord means it's least. Be careful of that, of what it can do. He says there in there, Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware. Take heed, be on the lookout for this. It can sneak up on you. You may not even realize it until it's too late. But here's a warning that, that God has given be, take heed and beware of covetous. Be on the lookout for it. Uh, so uh, be careful. And if you think about the, the parable or the, the two brothers that he spoke of, now which one was committed to sin to being a, a covetous individual? Which one committed that sin? Now he was talking to both of them. As he just said there, as we, as we read, he, talk, he spoke to both of them. It's the one that that wouldn't give his inheritance up? Is he the covetous individual? Or the brother, the younger brother, who is wanting more? Is he the covetous individual? Or really, is it both of them that are being a covetous individuals? I'm going to tend to lean toward the, the youngest. Could be the oldest, but I don't say the youngest. Because when the inheritance was divided up after parents have died, the older sibling got half. And then the rest of the siblings, you would divide the remainder up equally among them. So this older brother, he's got half of his father's inheritance. And probably it's already been divided, divided out. And here comes this younger brother saying, I want more. I want more. And yet the law said, this is, this is the way it's to be done. He wasn't satisfied with the law. He didn't accept the law. He didn't accept uh, just the ways that, that were put out there, how this was to, was to be handled. So therefore, probably I would think he is the, the one that was covetous. He wasn't satisfied. He wasn't content with what the law said he was to get. Of course, it could have been both of them, the older he, he, I probably wouldn't hurt him to give a little more if he wanted to, but he wasn't going to do it. 
So uh, there's question number three. Covetous is what Christ is warning about. Question four. While other sin is covetous linked, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11, there are several linked together here. Paul says, but now I have written to you not to, not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater, reviler or drunkard or extortioner, not to even eat with such a person. So covetous here is listed with these big ones. Uh, we, we, we have a way of uh, categorizing sin. Well, he put it right in there with uh, sexual immorality, which is fornication, uh, idolatry, uh, reviler, somebody always wanting to stir, stir things up, a drunkard or extortioner. Again, a covetous person. Don't eat with that person. Stay with a brother now. He's talking about a brother. A Christian who, who these can happen to. So it's listed there. It's a very serious sin. Uh, you're le lessening your dependence on God uh, by wanting that. Question five, define covetousness. Well, it's in, in uh, satisfiable desire to find fulfillment, meaning, and purpose in things instead of God. Again, there's a person who just, just cannot be satisfied with God's blessings. And it leads to other sins. Why, why do people steal? Why do they steal? They covet what you have. They won't. Why do people murder? Well, they want something. They murder you, maybe to acquire something from you. Maybe not all murders are, are associated with covetous, but many of them are. Adultery. Again, you want something that's not yours, something you're not to have, but you want it anyway from, a, from the, another individual. So covetous will lead to many other sins. Again, it's best, always best to stay away from it. Question six. Does the world honor the covetous go-getter? Well, Psalms 10.3 says, For the wicked boasts of their heart's desire, he blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. Well, the, word do, the world does honor those who are very covetous individuals. Uh, there's some individuals out there in the world who are entrepreneurs and they're hard workers. They are risk takers, and they are well rewarded for their actions. And then there's some who do these things, and when is enough enough? When is enough enough? And how are they using their wealth? That's what you really need to look at. How are they using it? Are they just uh, packing it more and more and more and more and putting it on the bed somewhere and mattresses, you know, it's all this money that there's no way they could ever spend, spend it in their lifetime. Or you have some individuals who understand where these blessings have come from and they're using them for, for godly things, good things they use those for. But the world sometimes uh, will honor the covetous individual. You know, uh, just some names here, the Elon Musk, Gates and uh, Zuckerberg, you know, they have their billions upon billions of dollars. And, and again, the world talks about them. They don't talk about the little fella that's, you know, using his to, 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 to uh, promote godly works. You don't hear that. Question seven. Are the covetous pra are the covetous particular how they obtain the objects of their greed. When First Kings there 21 is the, uh, it's the story of Ahab and Jezebel, how Ahab wanted the vineyard of Naboth, but Naboth would not sell it to him. 
And if you remember, Ahab goes home and he's pouting. And he goes to bed pouting. And Jezebel says, well, I'll get you your vineyard. Your vineyard. Just hang on. So she brings uh, Naboth in for a big feast. She gets some individuals to lie about him, to say that he had uh, blasphemed. And because of that, uh, you know, he's stoned. So there's a, like in there, uh, First Kings, there's some individuals that their greed will cause them to do a lot of things. And the covenants will cause them to do a lot of things. And there we have a biblical example of Jezebel doing that very thing. How she uh, caused Naboth to die and Ahab got his, got his vineyard. And then read the rest of the story. It didn't turn out so well for him. He's out there looking at it and that's when Elijah came, comes up to him and tells him some very difficult news he didn't like. Question 8. How is covetous pro- portrayed by how we use our things as well as how we get them. Uh, this talks about the, what we just read. The rich young farmer. The rich farmer. He got The farmer, he got a good harvest because of the hard work. He did the work. And God blessed him. God blessed his work and what he did. But it was how he planned to use it that got him in trouble. He didn't recognize God for what God did. He was only thinking about himself. And if you read through there in Luke 12, how many times this farmer gives himself credit. Look what I did. Here's what I'm going to do. It's, I think it's about 12 times those verses. He speaks of himself, patting himself on the back, and uh, only thinking about himself. But God, uh, again, took... He lost his, his life. His life was taken that night. And then what good did it do him? <clears throat> Question nine. What does covetousness do to our relationship with God? Well, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetous, which is idolatry. So Colossians 3, 5, covetous is idolatry. And we begin to worship things. It's what we do. And God doesn't want anything to come between us and Him. He doesn't want us to worship something else. He's a very jealous God. He doesn't want anything to come between us. So it can be idolatry. And then Matthew 6, 24, no man or no one can serve two masters or he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we can't let the things in life become a God to us because God does not want to share us with anything or anybody as far as things we're going to put before him. Not that. Question 10, how does covetousness affect our relationship with our fellow man? Well, Amos 2 and verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. It will cause one to mistreat another individual is what covetous individual will do. There's no limit to what this person may do to obtain what another has. As Amos says here, now this is what Israel was doing. Uh, they would sell the righteous for silver. You say you had to go to a court of law and you were in the right. The person who's in the wrong may go to the judge and say, if you'll, if you'll rule my way, I'll, I'll pad your pocketbook. And the judge does. And you're in the right, but you lose. Or for a pair of sandals, they're the poor. They'll take your sandals even. They'll do that and, and sell them in order to, to make something. And that's what Israel was doing. 
So we want to we don't want to fall into the the same sins that they fell into and how God brought about their destruction is what Amos is telling them. <clears throat> Question eleven. Why is covetous covetousness most harmful to its possessor? Well, first Timothy six, nine and ten. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown man, men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's not money itself, but it's the love of money that has brought this about. When, when you're Focus in life is, is money. You've got to have it. You'll find some individuals who have that focus. That's all that's on their mind. He talks there about it brings about destruction and perdition. Uh, destruction and loss of the soul is what it will do. It will cause one's soul to be lost. So we don't want to have that, that kind of love for it that we will do most anything to acquire it. Number 12, what can the Christian afford? Why can the Christian afford to be liberal? Uh, Hebrews 13, 5, that your conduct be without covetous, be content, content with such things you have. And he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, be content. If we can just find contentment knowing that God will provide for us. He'll take care of us. Uh, sometimes we just uh, can't have the contentment that God wants us to have. And there's nothing wrong with wanting things. We all want things. Uh, the question is, what extent will we go to to acquire them, to get them? What, what extent will we go to? That's, that's where the problem lies. I want it so bad I'll do anything to get it. Well, you don't want to do that. It can cost you your soul to do such. Question 13. What must our attitude be toward material things? First uh, John 2.15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it. In James 4.14. He talks there about life is short. Only here for a little while and vanishes away. Uh, be careful of the things that the world has to offer. And remember that one day we're going to leave it all behind. And somebody else is going to get it. And they're going to do with it possibly what we wouldn't do. What we don't want them to do. They may do it with it anyway. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the thing that bothered Solomon a lot. Here he is, he said, I worked hard for what I have. You know, he's the wealthiest man to ever live. I have all this wealth, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to leave it to someone who will not appreciate it. That was his, one of his greatest fears, how they might waste it and use it on things or for things that he would not approve of. And yet there's nothing he can do about it. And there's nothing we can do about it. We... We have our wills, I guess, and we're going to leave it all behind one day. We may think we have a little bit of control over it. We tell them how to use it, but it, things can change. A lot of that can change quickly. Number 14, what is the real cure for covetousness? Uh, first, I have a, yes, Matthew 16. I got 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing to this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. The more contentment we have, the more happiness we will have. And we need to be content with our daily blessings that God's given to us. If we'll just sit down and count them, I mean literally count them, what he has done, then we'll, we'll be happy. More content. 
The classroom questions, what evils do you see in the world that cause covetousness? Well, we, we read 1 Corinthians 5, 11. It's all there. Uh, sexual immorality, idolatry, drunkenness, extortion. Uh, war is one that's a product of covetousness. Somebody want another country, want why another one has. War. A lot of, lot of lives have been lost because of covetous dealing with war. Number two, what causes people to covet? Are they born that way? Well, first of all, we're not born that way. If it's a sin, then we wouldn't have it. So we're not born with that. But one factor that plays a deal with, with our covetousness is commercialization. You know, if TV tells us, commercials tell us, your life will be so much better if you have this. You just have one more and you get it, and before you know it, here comes another new one out. It's better. And you got to have it. And uh, those who are promoting it, they want your money. It's what they're wanting. But if we'll just uh, be satisfied with what we have and not fall for their trickery, well, then we'll be better off. Looking at what others have is another reason that can cause us to covet. I wish I had that. They sure do look happy because they have this. We think if I get it, but it won't happen. If we get what they got, then they upgrade. Here we go again. Chasing the dog chasing his tail. And number three, is there any way one can determine for himself if he is covetous? Well, am I content? Am I content or am I always wanting what somebody else has? I'm always wanting the newest product. That might be a, a, a warning for us if we're just not content that we may have a little bit of covenant in us. And be careful of that and leave it alone. Be content. So this was a one that we've got to look out for because it can, it can sneak, up, sneak up on us and not even recognize it. Any comment or questions on the on the lesson? Any of them? All right, time for the bail. We'll end here.